Good evening to everyone. I am Kamla Rampasad de Silva, Chief Executive Officer of the Caribbean Corporate Governance Institute. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this session entitled Vaccination Bonus from Employers. Is it allowed? The COVID-19 pandemic has taken a toll on businesses over the last year, and particularly in Trinidad and Tobago, where we are currently seeing the worst surge in cases since the pandemic began. As a matter of fact, a mere few hours ago, the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago announced a curfew to citizens, which further restricts movements, not just of people, but certainly of businesses. Today's session was inspired by an article of the same name that was written by Mali Bulwadi and Sophie Van Litt from the Dutch Caribbean. The two young ladies work at the same law firm as Professor Frank Kuhneman, who has been a presenter for the CCGI in the past. We are very pleased that they have accepted to do this presentation today. Mali and Sophie are joined by a regional panel comprising uh, Stephanie Fingal, CEO of the Employers Consultative Association of Trinidad and Tobago, Gavin Goff, attorney at law from Jamaica, who will be joining us shortly, and Avia Marie Lindy, who is a CEO of Metro Computers and Supplies Limited from Guyana, and also a director of the Caribbean Corporate Governance Institute. Today's special session will discuss the legal and other implications of companies wanting to encourage staff to take the COVID-19 vaccines. Because as we know in our region, employees' medical records are confidential documents. As such, boards in guiding their management team and senior managers should be aware of the implications for their organizations in order to avoid pitfalls of lawsuits and reputational damage. We are also joined by members of the media today. We have had interests from I-95.5, from the Express newspaper and IETV. Today's discussion, as I shared earlier, is also being carried live on a Facebook stream from the Caribbean Corporate Governance Institute's page. And it will be broadcasted as a delayed broadcast a few days from, from now on IETV. In welcoming everyone who has joined us today, I want to share that the Caribbean Corporate Governance Institute is a nonprofit membership organization. And we welcome everyone who wishes to join in our purpose of improving corporate governance practices in the region. We have lots of events and activities geared to this purpose, including a series entitled Lessons from the Boardroom, which focuses on mentoring the next generation of directors. We also have an international learning network led by Professor Bob Garrett, author of The Fish Rots from the Head, which meets every two months to discuss evolving governance practices. The next meeting will be on June 2nd with a presentation by Charlotte Vallet, former chairman of the Institute of Directors of London on onboarding and orientation of directors. Then we have our signature event, Governance Week, which will run from June 27th to July 2nd this year. The opening ceremony will be held on June 27th with an opening keynote to be delivered by Professor Mervyn King of South Africa, Chair Emeritus of the King Committee and one of the foremost authorities of corporate governance today. This will be followed by a week of activities with day one focusing on corporate secretaries, day two, governance in the private sector, day three, governance of the public sector, day four, governance of family owned businesses, and day five will focus on governance of groups and conglomerates with Professor Bob Garrett leading us on board evaluations in this very complex environment. The Caribbean Corporate Governance Institute is collaborating also with five other governance institutes around the world to host a Women in Governance Conference, which will begin on July 29th this year. Collaboration includes the Board of Directors Institutes from the Gulf, South Africa, New Zealand, Hong Kong, and Mauritius. The conference will run over a three-week period 
for a low price of 50 US. Registration is open, so we invite you to go on our website for details of this and our other offerings, which includes our Certificate and Corporate Governance Program. This program is being run currently with the module three being held next week to be facilitated by Dr. Jules Ferdinand of St. Vincent and module four the next week with uh, Howard Dutton facilitated finance corporate reporting. So just some quick housekeeping announcements before I hand over to our chairman, Mr. Nigel Romano, who will be our moderator for today. We would like to ask all of our participants in the room to please ensure that their names are listed on the participants list so everyone can identify who is in the room with them. Further, we would like everyone to keep their microphones on mute throughout the session. Following the presentation by Mali will be the panel discussion by our regional participants. We have included a half hour of Q&A where we would allow you, all of our participants in the room to ask questions. Those of you who are new to Zoom, there's an icon at the bottom of your screen to raise your hands when you want to get our attention. When you are invited to speak by the moderator, you will need to unmute yourself. And we ask that you press the mute icon again as, so, as soon as you are done to minimize any disruptive noises. You may also make comments and ask questions in the chat feature during the session. We ask you to please be judicious and make contributions as precisely as possible to allow time for other participants. Technical support today is being provided by Christy Johnsela Crouch from SmartServe Limited. If you want to get support for your online Zoom meetings, feel free to contact Christy because she really provides excellent support to us. And now it is my pleasure to hand over to the chairman of the Corporate Governance Institute, who will serve as the moderator for today's session. So Nigel, it's in your hands now. Thank you, Kamlo. Good afternoon. And I want to thank Sophie and Mali for their article and for agreeing to do this. Um, I'm looking forward to the conversation because this is very topical. So without further ado, I want to hand it over to Sophie and Mali and, and we're here to listen and learn. Thank you. Thank you so much. I will start with sharing my screen. Uh, so mm -hmm. we can all view the presentation. There we go. Uh, today we're going to talk about vaccinations for a safe workplace, instructions and incentives. Um, I'm Marley Buwalda. I'm an attorney with Van Epsken and Van Dornen. And uh, I specialize in uh, a broad litigation practice, including employment. And uh, today also present is Sophie van Lint. I'm a senior associate and attorney with Van Epsken and Van Dornen uh, with a deep specialization in employment and therefore a very good uh, person to ask all kinds of questions uh, that you might have in this matter. Um, we are supported by a panel and I think it's very good to uh, give the panel the opportunity to shortly uh, give an introduction about themselves uh, so that uh, after the presentation we, we can have to know uh, everyone. So if I can give uh, Stephanie, the opportunity to introduce yourself. Hello, everyone, and good evening. I'm Stephanie Fingal from the Employment Consultative Association, uh, all the way in Trinidad and Tobago. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. And I think we also have Gavin present. Hi, guys. Can you see me? Not as yet, Gavin. Oh, there you are. Yeah. Here I am. Hi, I'm Gavin Goff. I'm an attorney at law and partner in the law firm, Miles Fletcher and Gordon. I'm here from Kingston, Jamaica, and I'm excited to be part of this panel. Thank you. And I think the last member of the panel is Avia. Pleasant evening, everyone. I'm Avia Lindy, and I'm Chief Executive Officer of Metro Office and Computer Supplies, Guyana. I'm also a director at the Caribbean Corporate Governance Institute. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so now we know everyone, I think we should get right into it. And then it would be great if I, let's just, yeah, there we go. 
what are we going to talk about today? Uh, first of all, it's important to understand the background of why we are talking about this. And the background is we want to create a safe workplace and work environment for ourselves and our employees. Uh, secondly, we're going to talk about uh, what can we do to achieve this? And there's two ways, broadly. One, we can give instructions to our employees and obligate them to do certain things. And the second one is to stimulate behavior and give incentives to our employees uh, to make them do the appropriate behavior and the behavior we want to see. A safe workplace. A uh, safe workplace is a duty of care of an employer. An employer has to provide a safe workplace and an employer is uh, responsible to create that for their employees. And um, we can see this as uh, when you're working with heavy machinery, you should make sure your employees are protected. And when we're in the middle of a global pandemic, you should also make sure your employees are protected protected from the virus. And in that light, uh, it is important to make sure that uh, your employees are protected at the workplace from getting COVID-19. Uh, in our jurisdiction, which is Dutch Caribbean, this includes the islands um, Aruba, Curaçao, Bonaire, St. Martin, St. Estasis and Saba. Uh, when you do not uh, properly execute the duty of care, you are liable for the damages that your employees suffer because of that. Um, so any damages that your employees, like let's say uh, your employee gets wounded in the workplace, your employee can hold you as an employer liable for that. And in your jurisdictions, it might be very much the same. And that light is also important to make sure your workplace is safe. And thirdly, even if you do not have the dirty of care or the liability, it is favorable for you as a company to have your employees be in good health. Uh, employees that are sick and at home uh, cost you money and employees that are at work working Working money, so it's as simple as that. And during the COVID pandemic, there are some extra incentives. Uh, we see that um, employers provide, uh, who have fully vaccinated teams, promote their businesses by being fully vaccinated, or employers that get regularly tested, uh, their employees, they, pro they promote their businesses as COVID-free zones. So it can also, in this regard, be a bit of a marketing tool. So how to go about this? There's two ways, instructions and incentives. Instructions uh, can be given to employees in all kinds of manners. We see it all the time. Uh, coming to work on time, uh, smoke in certain areas, don't smoke in other areas, um, don't use drugs. These kind of instructions are very common. Less common are the COVID-19 instructions because they are relatively new. And a problem with these COVID-19 instructions is that they often are interference of the bodily integrity of the employee. Your bodily integrity the right to do what your body, what you want to do with your body, is a fundamental human right. We see this in international law. Uh, it is part of your. Oh, my Siri thought how strong to him was. So um, we see this in uh, international law. It is linked to your uh, security of life and it's linked to your right to privacy. And we also see it in many constitutions. In our, our jurisdictions, this in the constitutions, and I checked the, the Constitution of Barbados, and uh, we see in Article 11, Chapter 3, that is also integrated in the Constitution of Barbados. So it is very common and it's also international. So we can say it's, it's in all of our region, or lead integrity is a human right. What we then often see is when something is a human right and your human right is violated, that people then automatically assume it's prohibited. That's not the case. Um, most human rights are not absolute, um, except the right to torture, actually no human rights are absolute. Uh, we see it all the time, like we all have a right to freedom and also all of our countries have prisons. Uh, we all have a right to privacy, but when we are interrogated by the police, we are expected to tell the truth. So human rights are not absolute and they can be interfered with. However, uh, it has to be a justifiable interference in order not to be prohibited. So when is an interference justified? There has to be a legitimate aim. It has to be foreseeable. It has to be proportional. And it is impossible to achieve the goal in a less interfering manner. So a legitimate aim in the case of COVID-19 pandemic is public health. This is very legitimate. Uh, we all want to ensure public health and it is important for everybody. Foreseeability is, did you see that coming, basically? Um, if we look at, uh, for example, prisons, like we all know that if we commit a crime, there's a chance we cannot look up, end up in prison. 
this is foreseeable, we knew about this beforehand. In the COVID-19 pandemic, that can be a bit more tricky as I will get into in a bit. It has to be proportional. We have the interference and then we have the goal. The interference has to be proportional to the goal achieved. And then it has to be impossible to achieve in a less interfering manner. So if it's very big interference, it is easier to say it's impossible. It is possible to achieve in a less interfering manner. So as we can see in practice, uh, let's say the obligation to vaccinate. This is a big interference of the bodily integrity of your employee. You putting a foreign, a foreign subject or a substance, uh, foreign subject into the body of your employee. Um, you're not taking anything out. Um, some employees might absolutely not agree with this. Uh, so it's a big interference. Is there a legitimate aim? Yes, public health. Was it foreseeable? Most of the time it was not. We have seen certain contracts in which it could be said to be foreseeable. For example, contracts in which already other vaccinations are obligatory. So as we sometimes see at hospitals, uh, doctors and nurses are sometimes required to take certain vaccinations and it would not be too surprising that they also would take COVID-19 vaccinations. However, in your average employment contract, there is no obligatory vaccinations. Was it proportional? It depends on your work. If you work with elderly, if you work with chronic sick people, if you work, uh, let's say, in, in a hospital, uh, it might be proportional. Um, taking, not taking the vaccination might actually cause someone in close proximity to you or someone you work with uh, to get really sick and maybe even die from the COVID virus. However, let's say you work in an office, in your own office, uh, distance is possible, or you work, let's say, as a gardener, um, it might not be that proportional because there's a very small chance that someone around you gets the virus just because you are not vaccinated. Is it possible to achieve in a less interfering manner? Because it's such a big interference, it is often possible to achieve in a less interfering manner. Let's say a test obligation or mask policy or social distancing. Um, all these things might also be able to achieve this goal. So therefore, the obligation to vaccinate is for many employers not an option. If we then look at other instructions you might give, like a mandatory mask policy or a test obligation, the story is different. Mandatory mask policy, legitimate aim? Yes, public health. Foreseeable? More foreseeable. Like when we go to supermarkets, we have to wear a mask. When we go to the pharmacy, we have to wear a mask. So it's, it's foreseeable that also at your place of work, you might have to wear a mask. Is it proportional? It is not, it is a small interference against the legitimate aim of public health. So it might be very well proportional to give a small, to have this small interference for this important goal. Is it impossible to, to achieve in a less interfering manner? Usually not because it is such a small interference, like what else would be smaller. So this is often allowed. However, in test obligation, it gets a little bit more tricky. We have seen in jurisprudence that testing for drugs, for example, is allowed, or that blood testing is allowed in certain cases. However, it is a bit more interfering than a mask, so you have to have a bit bigger of a reason and a bit more of a chance to uh, infect people in your close proximity in a serious way to put this in your company. But um, it might very well be allowed as well in your certain situation. And it is always good that if you want to do one of these things, like contact your lawyer to see if in your situation it's possible. If you don't want to do a breach at all, you can look at incentives. The good thing about incentives is that there is no interference with the bodily integrity. So you don't have to go by that list. And incentives would be uh, one, to inform your employee, or two, to give the vaccination bonus. For to inform your employee, there is actually hardly any rules. Like you can inform your employee about basically everything you want to inform your employees about. Uh, the only thing is keep it to the real information and separate facts uh, from fake news. And uh, then basically you can, you can do many things. Like it is good to, if you hear your employees talk about something you know to be fake news, like say to them, hey, this is, this is not the case. Like, please read from these sources. If you want to do a meeting about how to recognize fake news, you can organize it. If you want to do a vaccination bonus, it gets a bit more tricky, as we will get into on this slide. You can namely not pressure your employee uh, 
too much into something. If you create a bonus that is so high and so um, creates a really big uh, change in your employee's life, your employee might be uh, taking the vaccine just because he gets the bonus. And that would be going too far. Like you don't want to have that to be the only reason. And in many jurisdictions, it is not allowed to have that be the only reason. It would be unauthorized pressure on the employee and unauthorized pressure is unauthorized and therefore prohibited. But what you can do is put a bonus in, in place that um, is comparable to other bonuses you might already have in your company or put a non-material bonus like um, a vacation day or two vacation days. And that might give a little bit of an incentive, but it would not be an authorized pressure. So look a little bit of what in your company would be the limit of what you can do. And the other thing you have to take into account is the medical privacy of the employee. As Kamla already noted, medical data is, has to be protected and medical data cannot be filed from your employee in some jurisdiction is completely unauthorized to file medical data of your employee. If this is the case, you have to get a bit creative. There is ways around this. However, um, you have to think about it and really um, be aware of what the rules are in your jurisdiction. For example, in our jurisdictions, uh, you cannot file any medical data. So what you have to do is, how can I do this without filing medical data? So uh, let's say you wanna do a vaccination bonus, you announce this. Um, you're not gonna ask the employees, did you get vaccinated? You say, if you get vaccinated, come to me. It will be your uh, choice to share this data with me or not. Um, if they tell you, do not file it. Do not keep a list. Uh, just let them tell you. And then you uh, register them for the bonus, but do not make the list like this is vaccinated. Yes, no. Uh, don't watch out the um, administration. Because if you administrate it as a COVID vaccination bonus, you kind of indirectly filing it. So uh, administrate it under a regular name like any other bonus would. Um, and furthermore, you have to think about uh, not having them sent electronically the proof. Like if you want your employees to prove it, uh, let them show it physically or just believe your employees. And in such manners, it is possible uh, to still uh, execute the bonus without filing the medical data. Thirdly, you have to think about the work environment. Um, there's a lot of different opinions about uh, the vaccine, um, whether people get it or not. If people are skeptical about um, if it's working, if it's bad for you. So um, having this vaccination bonus might create a division between your employees and might create some struggle. Um, you also might have employees with certain sicknesses that are not able to get the vaccine. If such is the case, you have to think about this as well. You might want to uh, give the bonus as well to, uh, when people prove they are not eligible to get the vaccine, but really wanted to. And fourthly, you have to think about uh, your online reputation. Uh, we have seen companies that have recently given out a vaccination bonus or made a vaccine obligatory and have been flooded with bad reviews. It is a very sensitive topic and people might not agree with it, and your customers might not agree with it. Uh, you might get random trolls in your comments and basically flooding it with, with bad reviews. So really think about it. Uh, who's my public? Who's gonna know about this? Is the media gonna pick up of this? And is this something that is good for my company to do? If you then come to the conclusion, I wanna do it, you can look at these companies that have gone before you. Uh, we see um, the different ways they went about it. We see in general, uh, they keep it a relatively low, um, $300, $100, Euro, $100 couple hours free. This is usually what is given up. Um, it is important to take into account what your employees uh, are earning and what is proportionate for your company. So something that might be proportionate in the United States might not be proportionate um, on the, where we live on Bonaire. So this is something you should uh, think about and uh, then apply. For example, um, Serbia is one of the only countries now that is giving uh, a vaccination bonus uh, from uh, the country. 
and that is $30. So Serbia, the salaries are low, so it's not comparable to the US where $500 are given. If we look at um, how this is received, uh, we can look at the New York Times survey that has been done. Uh, they have questioned um, Americans and they have said, uh, would you be more likely, less likely uh, to get the vaccine if you get uh, a monetary payment, if you get a, a bonus for it? And they have tested this, um, they have asked this question with $25, $50 and $100. And you see already with $25 in the American public, 28% uh, of the respondents uh, are more likely to take the vaccine. So even a small reward uh, can already have uh, some impact. And so don't think that it has to be that big. Uh, you can start small and, and see what that does. And some people get really creative. Uh, we have uh, seen in the news uh, that Ohio uh, and the Cayman Islands, uh, as we see uh, here the Minister of Tourism from, uh, organize a vaccination lottery in which uh, you can win prizes. In Ohio, uh, they go up to a million. And uh, in the Caymans, they keep it a little bit more modest and you can win a staycation or a dinner voucher. And we see in uh, St. Martin uh, that with your vaccination, you get a 20% discount voucher at the Carrefour. Uh, this is not for employees. This is like to incentivize other people like in the public. And it's more like a social responsibility thing. Uh, but you, you see companies getting really creative with this and you see that there's many ways to incentivize the people around you uh, to get these vaccines. And that would be the end of my part of the presentation. Uh, I thank you all for your attention and I, I welcome uh, any questions. Thank you, Molly. I think we'll save the questions until after the panelists do their thing. So I'm going to ask Stephanie to, to jump in and, and give her perspective from the Employers Consultative Association in Trinidad. Okay, thank you very much, Nigel. But actually, I'll say this, I am from the Employers Consultative Association and present I am the interim CEO. But really, this is, uh, this is brand new. And uh, what I would say <laughs> is that this is my view at this point in time. I've read the article written okay. by Sophie and Marley. And of course, I've been looking at you know, different um, comments and commentaries and so about the issue. And uh, while we are speaking about this vaccine, which is, I mean, relatively new on the market, although we hear that research would have been going on for quite some time, everybody talks about the longevity of the vaccine. Do we know enough about it? Do we know what are really the side effects? One in 40,000 getting a blood clot or how many in 40,000? Is that comfortable for us? And a whole range of questions come up. For employers, a big question is, what's the possible litigation? Were I to introduce something like this? In our territory in Trinidad, we do not have any legislation that would allow that. We know we have public vaccinations that the government would run like when we had uh, yellow fever and different things like that. But at this point in time, there is no public health instruction or order. There is no position by the government. The unions will not have been engaged and so on. So it's really something that's novel, just like the virus. And it raises a lot of questions as to even given an incentive bonus, there are still certain quote unquote liabilities attached to that. So I asked the question as an employer, I need to make sure my workplace is safe for my employees, myself, and my customers, my suppliers, and everybody else. And we have under our USH Act that responsibility to ensure the safety and health of everyone and the well being of people as well. So I can institute a drug test so that I don't have people um, causing accidents or injuries to others. I can have a pre employment medical. I can do those things within the workplace. Or if you are, unwell for, you know, frequently, and so I could still send you for a medical assessment. So hearing about the introduction of mandatory vaccination brings to light some of these very issues. Maybe I can have it as a pre-employment condition, but will that be fair under my Equal Opportunity Act in that not all employees across the country are required to do that? Is this employer being unduly you know, difficult, is he being unfair? Um, were I not to be able, why to have some conditions that prevents me from taking that, that vaccine? 
then I'll be thrown out of the, of the group who can be considered for the job. So it raises some issues of um, related to equal opportunity. What about my health? If I took this vaccine, it's available. Um, why to die? Why to become very ill? Who's going to pay for the leave, the leave days that I might require? Who would compensate my family, even if it's a pre-employment medical? And uh, who would be liable for all of these things? Would the insurance coverage that I have cater for that? Uh, is there a coverage under the Workmen's Compensation Act? And, and does my insurer, or will my insurer be willing to, to cover those sorts of things? I remember HIV. Not all insurers covered it, and it was a very difficult thing to get an insurer to cover something like HIV because it was not considered a social disease, and therefore coverage was not normal. You couldn't get it easily. So all of those things will come up. Uh, medical expenses, if I had to be hospitalized afterwards, who would pay for all of those things? And uh, we go on to talk about a precedent that you might be setting. I'm thinking of employees saying, hey, well, I will take the money because they want me to take the vaccine. I'm game. I'm getting paid. Could we be setting a dangerous precedent for employers in going forward when we decide to give this incentive and everyone likes cash or whether it is more holidays or whether it is, you know, whatever benefit I choose to give cash of kind that has some some, you know, good value for me. Um, I think I'm um, mentioning the, the proportional value based on the income of that person. So that you could find down the road, there might be some other important um, in, initiative you want to introduce that might then cause employees to think, so what's the incentive in it for me? And could you be setting that precedent that when you have to introduce some very serious things, people might be looking for an incentive in going forward. So you have all of those things to consider um, at this point in time, and uh, we're looking at the other aspect of it, however, employees have a responsibility for their safety and health and for others. And we know under our USH Act, that is a requirement that puts on employers a responsibility. They have the responsibility, the employees have responsibility to put regulations and, and, and procedures and policies in place. And if employees were to breach those policies and regulations, they can be disciplined. There can be fines under the Offensive um, Offenses Act and so for someone who willingly and knowingly um, found themselves to be ill and went to work and probably caused somebody else to, to become ill. And I talked about it yesterday saying that if you have the symptoms of coronavirus and you went to work in spite of all the regulations, the knowledge both outside and within the workplace you really, you, you, you are a weapon in, in that employee, employment, place of employment, because you are now walking around potentially able to cause the death of another individual. And we could go on and on and talk about, you know, the, the ethical thing to do and the right thing to do, both for as an individual, as a citizen, as another human being, as well as an employee with that OSH responsibility that people must have. I was reading an article by someone called Vajish Jain, and NIHR Academic Clinical Fellow in Public Health Medicine in UCL. And he said, in a liberal democracy, forcing the vaccination of millions of young and healthy citizens who perceive themselves to be at an acceptably low risk from COVID-19 will be ethically disputed and is politically risky. He goes on to say in the early 1990s, polio was, an, and was endemic in India with between 500 and 1,000 children getting paralyzed daily. By 2011, which is 11 and 10, 21 years later, the virus was eliminated. It was not achieved through legislation, and I, that would go with it was not mandatory. It was down to a consolidated effort to involve communities, target high need groups, understand concerns, inform, educate, remove barriers, invest in local delivery systems, and link with political and religious leaders. Mandatory vaccination is rarely justified, rarely R-A-R-E-L-Y. This successful rollout of novel COVID-19 vaccines will require time, communication, and trust. We have come too far, too fast to lose our nerve now. So I'll close by saying that there is a lot of literature. And from where I sit in Trinidad and Tobago, I believe that we have not done the education sufficiently at the levels that we are. We should do it. 
there's still a lot of, um, you know, you see articles and, and videos going around and we're really not too sure. Some of us are inclined to, you know, guess and second guess everything. We need some forum, some, some communication channel, some way of getting people to understand really the truth, the fact, the importance, the seriousness of this particular virus and how the vaccine can help us, you know, in, in a way that it becomes voluntarily easily. And with time, it will, you know, the mandatory vaccine and incentives might not be necessary. I close. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, very interesting points, and I'm sure you're going to have a good discussion. I mean, yes. let me hand it over to Gavin for his comments from Kingston. Gavin. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you. Um, it's a very interesting topic, and I'm glad again that I was invited to speak on this and give a perspective from Jamaica, which is in some ways ahead of the curve, and in other ways, especially as it relates to our legislation in this area, I think we're very far behind. Um, so, you know, I've heard about the occupational safety and health legislation. We've been working on that, we really have been for about 20 years now. So maybe by the time 2040 comes around, we will have, um, you know, that piece of legislation in place to guide us. We don't really have a lot of anti-discrimination legislation either. Um, I heard the term, um, I spoke about unauthorized pressure. I had to go and Google what that is because we don't have that in Jamaica. Um, so if, and in terms of unfair contract terms, never heard of it. So, I mean, a lot of our legislation on labor revolution, so to speak, occurred in the late seventies. And we have been kind of lagging since then. So, and even in the late 70s, it was really focused more around um, the unionized movement and unionized employees. So what you will see in our laws is that discrimination was really targeted around preventing discrimination against the union, making sure that union busting wasn't a thing. And so as it related to benefits, which you could, um, were prohibited from giving people. It was really all centered around making sure you weren't treating the non-unionized workers better than the unionized ones as an inducement to stay away from the union. But as it relates to any other benefit, we don't have any legislation at all to you know, determine whether or not what you're doing in terms of favoring one set of employees is going to be seen as unlawful. Now, of course, we do have constitutional provisions. So if someone were to give a vaccine, a, a bonus, whether it's a vaccine bonus or any other kind of bonus, only to, you know, women or men, um, then we might have a problem because, of course, um, your sex is a protected status. Your race is a protected status. But in Jamaica, your medical status and your medical history is not protected. Equally, we don't really have a lot of privacy legislation in Jamaica. We have a Data Protection Act, which has recently been passed, and it's soon to come into force. But there's really nothing in there either that really was, was designed for a situation like this um, to, to prevent you from asking certain questions, which would be considered too private. So when we're hiring someone in Jamaica, we basically can ask them anything we want. We can ask them if they're married, have children, their religion, you name it. <laughs> we don't have any restriction. And of course, as we might know, if you're going to be doing anything to protect a worker from discrimination, simply putting a law which says don't discriminate on these bases is not going to be enough. That's really not the, the problem because the source of the problem is that nobody tells you why they've not hired you. Nobody tells you why you've not gotten the, the bonus or the promotion. Um, so the real way that you can capture that kind of discrimination in the workplace is to stop people from asking the questions in the first place. You know, So you say that, no, this is private and you're not required to disclose this information if somebody asks you. And in fact, if somebody asks you this information and then you don't get the job, 
you can go to this body or that body and make a report and they can investigate whether you've been discriminated against. So you will have that kind of thing happening in Jamaica. But officially, the government's position here is that you know the vaccine is a choice, that they are not going to, at this stage, make it mandatory. Um, not even for their employees, and the state in Jamaica, like many other countries, is the largest employer. Yeah, you know, some of the agencies have indicated that they might require in certain for certain roles that you get vaccinated. They haven't said what will happen if you don't. Um, so that's somewhat of a gray area. But based on all the pronouncements we've heard, there would not be any disciplinary sanctions at all. It may affect your advancement in that organization and opportunities that you may be exposed to, but there certainly, at this point in time, doesn't appear to be any kind of um, sanction for not taking it. As it relates now to incentive, um, I think there's, it's, our environment is certainly ripe for that kind of discussion. It's a discussion which we are having here in Jamaica. Um, several of my clients have approached uh, me and my firm for advice in relation to this. Um, there will be used up some, some of the examples that Marley put up, a cash bonus, um, days off as well. But the companies which have approached me thus far are generally those that have an international footprint or presence. Um, the homegrown companies haven't quite reached there yet. Um, we tend in Jamaica to do things um, in a more aggressive fashion. <laughs> so there have been some companies which have basically said, it's and you take the job or you lose your job. And there's been some backlash in relation to that. And some companies which came out very strong with that policy have kind of had to um, at least publicly back away from it. I'm not sure what they're doing behind closed doors. But um, I think that there certainly is a lot of opportunity in Jamaica for incentives to work. I mean, there's a lot of hesitancy as well. And there's a lot of misinformation and fake news that's circulating. The hardest thing in this day and age is WhatsApp. The WhatsApp forwards are ridiculous in terms of the amount of fake information that is essentially being sent right into your phones and the phones of the people who work with you and work for you. So what we're finding out here is that there's a lot of hesitancy. And based on informal surveys which have been done, it is unlikely that Jamaica will reach the um, herd immunity numbers. Um, I think 65, 70% is, is really where we're, where we're aiming for. You know, based on the hesitancy levels now, we're not going to get there. And of course, as in more information comes out and as the, 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 the information campaign that the government intends to embark upon, as that rolls out some more, I think we'll see the hesitancy reduced and we'll see those numbers go up. Um, and also, you know, we do have a lot of restrictions in Jamaica now, which people are becoming tired of. I know in Trinidad, you guys are under curfew more, um, shortly. We've been experiencing curfews now for months. So um, we're a little burned out of them. And I think if we were to, you know, project a message of, you don't like the curfew, get the vaccine. And we'll see if we can, you know, ease up things. I think that would have an impact. I'm not sure the government is ready to go there yet. Um, <laughs> but a lot of private institutions as well are thinking about rolling out these incentives like discounts. Um, they haven't done it yet, but I think that we will see more of it coming out as we have discussions like this. So I think again, it's a very useful discussion for us to be having. Um, you know, I, I do a lot that in, in Jamaica or national, this is dish isn't actually Akian saltfish. It's KFC. And the things that Jamaican do for KFC, <laughs> I tell you, if you give us a short line, a special express line for vaccinated people only at KFC, believe you me, we have herd immunity in one month flat. So I think we're getting there though. Um, the numbers are going up. Um, you'd, you'd be surprised to see that we actually had a shortage of vaccines at one point in time. And so the discussion really wasn't so much about, you know, whether people are going to get it, but really when we could get it. 
Um, and, you know, we got the AstraZeneca vaccine and we got a batch of them at 75,000, right? And we got that batch one week before the expiration date. And originally, the government didn't tell anybody that the vaccines were going to expire. And then when they rolled out these vaccination blitzes, nobody was coming. The numbers were so low. And then they said it expires in three days' time. And I tell you, people broke their neck and ran to get the vaccines before the, the batch expired. So, you know, sometimes we have to use a brain, you know, sometimes we have to <laughs> understand the psychology of, of our people as, as part of the, the way we incentivize and get people to, to, to move in the direction we want. Um, and so now again, we're back to a situation where only people who are um, of a certain age are eligible to get the vaccine. Um, and in fact, we have been prioritizing those who have gotten their first shot already. So even people who want to get the first shot aren't necessarily so able to do it. And that, of course, goes back to what Marley was saying about the availability of the vaccine. If you're giving a bonus, it would necessarily require that everybody is eligible. Um, you can't really be giving a bonus only to the people who are eligible to get it. No, because then that would be discrimination based upon age, for instance, because only 50 and 60 year olds and over right now are eligible to get vaccinated out of the supply that we now have. So it's an interesting constitutional issue and a conundrum in some respects, because we want more people to get out there. We don't want these vaccines to go to waste at all. But we really can't be seen to be discriminating against the older folks or discriminating in favor in some respects of the older folks. I mean, right now, we already have a stay-at-home order for everyone over the age of 60. You're not eligible to go, unless you're exempt. You're not supposed to go to work at all. You're supposed to stay at home. And in fact, your employer, if you come to work, not only are they supposed to send you home, they're supposed to call the Ministry of, of Health and Wellness and report you. I don't think many people are doing that. But it just goes to show that we are prepared and we have been prepared to take some, you know, pretty drastic measures where necessary to try and protect our citizens. And some of these measures have questionable legal bases and could potentially be violating certain constitutional rights, but we don't get there yet. You know, no suits have been found yet, um, as far as I know, um, but I think they are coming. So it's good that we have these kind of discussions so we can all share our collective knowledge and, and, and hopefully be able to advise ourselves and our clients in the best way possible. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Gavin. It's, it's interesting that both Trinidad and Jamaica have KFC as the national dish almost. Um, I, I don't touch this stuff, so I have no idea. Avia, over to you. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be a part of this discourse. Quite an interesting discussion that has ensued so far. Marley, there was quite a lot of interesting information that you shared in your presentation. Mm -hmm. Stephanie, I would also like to endorse most of the sentiments you shared in your presentation. And Gavin, I thought your, your uh, presentation was quite interesting as well. I must give a disclaimer, the views that I'm going to be sharing here are not representative of the government of Guyana, the Chamber of Commerce, or any of the other organizations in Guyana. For me, this, the question of vaccine and incentives, I thought it was quite an insightful one. In Guyana, as you all are aware, we have not had extensive lockdowns and curfews like the other countries in the Caribbean. And we currently, our curfew is 4 to, to 10.30, 4 a.m. to 10.30. So we've not had any case of situations over the last 14 months where we had a total lockdown in our country. Um, you are aware that we are an oil producing country and we're in, in the boom of our oil economy presently. So of course, I. We didn't close our borders. 
but there are protocols in place to protect our nation as a whole. As it relates to the vaccination, I know the government was instrumental in getting vaccines. Initially, we started with vaccinating our elderly. And when that segment of our population was vaccinated, they made the vaccine available countrywide for everyone. From the private sector, in fact, when this, this when Kamla engaged me to join this discussion, I threw this question out to my community. I noticed PAG, Laura is here from the Rotary, from the from Rotary. So what I did was I threw this question out to my Rotary family to, to get their thoughts on vaccination and incentives and stuff like that. I also engaged the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and got an invited comment from the, the president of the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce. Along with other non-governmental organizations, I wanted to hear from um, males, females, a wide diverse cross-section of those of us who are in Guyana and has to deal with this pandemic. It was quite interesting, the feedback I received. It was diverse. And in fact, most persons were in favor of incentives, um, no material incentives or monetary incentives. I am not aware, to the best of my knowledge, that there are any companies in Guyana that are giving monetary incentives to their team members to take the vaccine. What I know is that in the private sector, the businesses have been very, very accommodating in terms of allowing members of their team to go off and get their vaccines. They've encouraged uh, more or less um, persons not to come out to work if they're not well. And in most cases, uh, in fact, there was someone I spoke with earlier today that indicated that they give their team, let's say four hours uh, when they got their vaccines, they had the driver take them home, they provided them with Panadol and stuff like that. So it's more of one of encouragement, not an imposition on persons that they must take it, but more of one of educating persons on the importance of the vaccine and also ensuring that it's not just about, um, it's not just about your safety, it's about the safety of others. And also if you love your company, you definitely want what's best for it. We're all aware that this has been 14 months that we've been in this pandemic. For us, um, from our company at Metro Office and Computer Supplies, which I happen to head, we have not laid off any of our employees. It was very, very difficult to maintain 50 plus persons, but we thought after the pandemic goes away, you still need your human resource if you, if you lay them off. And this is in the cases if you, if your company is financially stable, that you could have done that. I, I cannot um, discredit the companies who were not in a position to hold, keep all of their employees. This has to be premised on your fin financial stability and stuff like that. But I, generally, I think it would have been important. It would be great if you, we can encourage and educate our um, team members that it's important for them to have the vaccine. But if they choose not to, we cannot force them and we should not discriminate against anyone that doesn't have the vaccine. Unfortunately in Guyana, our um, workforce based on the fact that we have this oil and gas economy and we, not, we do not have the requisite skills, for, we definitely <laughs> have to import some of the skills that we need to grow this emerging sector. Coming back to the incentives, I've done some research and I went on the strategic human resource management website and I found um, some insightful information that I thought I'll share with you this evening. And this article was some employers offer COVID-19 vaccine incentive despite lack of guidance. And as all the speakers said before, there's not legislation that mandates vaccine. Um, there's some companies that have an HSSE policy in Guyana, this is like a new sector. We never paid so much attention to safety like we are now because of the oil and gas sector. And most companies are becoming compliant. And of course, we're getting lots of support from a special agency called the Center for Learning and Business Development, which is sponsored by Exxon. So the article cited 
there are pretty much four areas that should be looked at as it relates to vaccines. The EEOC said employers should evaluate four factors to determine whether direct threat exists in the workplace. One, the duration of the risk. Two, the nature and severity of the potential harm. Three, the likelihood that the potential harm will occur. And four, the imminence of the potential harm. There are also several reasons why pe persons may not want to take a vaccine. Reli there's something called religious accommodation, and I quote, if an employee cannot get vaccinated because of a disability or severely held religious belief, and there's no reasonable accommodation possible, an employer could exclude the employee from physically entering the workplace. And of course, that can be very controversial. And as uh, Mandy Me Marley mentioned earlier, you can have bad publicity and persons trolling your social media, your businesses could be affected if we mandate that persons have to take the vaccine. There are some instances or articles that I also read about persons terminating persons because they didn't take the vaccine. I, I, I think it's my humble opinion that that's ex extreme. I think we should more or less encourage persons. And, I, and generally, I think there's more education that needs to be shared on this matter. I, I would like to state that there's no playbook to deal with COVID. There's no playbook to deal with the aftermath of COVID. And it's something that we have to learn and adapt as we go along. Generally in Guyana, there is no, I don't think we are going to be mandating that anybody takes a vaccine, but generally they've made it available all across the country, clinics, uh, health centers. The religious organizations have also played their part. They've, like the Central Islamic Organization, they've been hosting vaccination um, sites. So a lot has been done and I, I must commend our government and the private sector for the role they've played um, in Guyana in ensuring that our workforce is kept safe. We still have rotation in terms of um, persons not having to be at work fully. And in some instances in the private sector, there's persons who are still working remotely. So, so there's a combination of um, a combination approach or more of a hybrid approach as it relates to vaccination. I, I would love for us to have herd immunity and, I, and, and it pains me to see what has been happening in the Caribbean countries as well. I know you, did, you rely heavily on tourism and this has been a very difficult period for everyone all, all across the world. At this point, I'd like to conclude by sta stating that I know persons respond to incentives. So I see uh, no issue in providing incentives to employees to take the vaccine once they're willing. Of course, those who may not want to take it, I don't think we should um, sanction them for not doing so, but we should come up with innovative ways of how we can have a win-win in this situation. Thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, Avia. Um, we have a lot of good food for thought and for conversation. Before I get questions and, and the comments, one of the things I'd like to say is that we need, I believe we need to spend more time listening to those who are concerned about the virus. As Gavin said, WhatsApp is on, on steroids. And you have a lot of people who are the recipients of very inaccurate and, and in many cases, they're not able to sift. However, you also have people who are against vaccines, vaccines generally. And one needs to take the time to listen to understand their concerns while at the same time sharing the employer's concerns and ensuring that the team member or the employee or whoever understands that you have their best interests at heart and that you need to work together to come up with an appropriate solution. I think in Mali's presentation, 
she noted very clearly that vaccines are one way to control the virus. Of course, you have all the PPE and all the protocols. And if somebody is not willing to take the vaccine, they have to understand that they, ha they have a responsibility to, to follow the protocol. So I think we need to have conversations. It's not just putting out data, but it's really connecting with team members to understand and meet them where they are and bring them along because <clears throat> the virus is, is mutating, it's changing, it's and 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 the situations are very fluid. And therefore we have to ensure that we keep ahead and keep educating people so that they take the vaccines voluntarily and we reduce the, the, the amount of incentivization, whether it's negative or positive, to get them to, to comply. So I will open it up to you all. I, I don't see any hands, hands raised, but I'll open it up to the audience generally or to you all to, to come back in with your comments, Marley or Stephanie. Oh, Sophie. Ah, there's Sophie. Go ahead, Sophie. Yes, if I can, you know, link up to what you're saying, Nigel. Um, I agree with you. It's very important for employers to inform their employees on, you know, the possible risks, but also the benefits of getting a vaccine. Um, and I think that is step one. Um, as an employer, you are also obliged to do that, I think, because, you know, you have to make sure that your people are well, well informed, especially um, if you are going to incentivize um, uh, getting a vaccine. Um, on the other hand, of course, employers are also have also other responsibilities. So also towards clients and guests and patients, for example. And so it's a very, you know, difficult position to be in, um, uh, which makes it even more, 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 you know, um, important to, to think this through and to think of a, a, the best strategy for your specific company. Because also, you know, it very much, I think, depends on the circumstances of the case, um, what, you know, an employer can do and should do. Um, and I heard Avia said, of course, you know, it's uh, the, to terminate, for example, an employment ag agreement because of, uh, you know, a, a refusal to get the vaccine is, is, is a very strong measure. But on the other hand, you have to think of, for example, a situation where you have a, uh, where you run a hospital and where, uh, you know, a nursing staff um, working with, uh, working at the, at the IC, for example, uh, refuses to get a, a vaccination, which puts patients at risk. Uh, then you also have, uh, you know, another position as an employer, you have the responsibility towards patients. And I don't believe then, uh, you know, uh, a termination of the employment agreement is, is, is the, the, the next step to take. Um, but then an employer should consider, you know, a transfer to a different, um, um, you know, a, a different function, for example. But it really, you know, it has to weigh the the interests of the employee, but also the interests of patients. And so um, I think it's it's a very, you know, a, a, as Avia also mentioned, there's no playbook, or as Nigel mentioned, I think there's no playbook for the pandemic, um, but also there's no, no, no general, um, uh, there's no general steps to take because it's very uh, dependent on the circumstances of the case and of the, you know, the, the sector that the employer is working in. Um, uh, and, and the risks, indeed, um, that are involved in, in, in having employees that are not vaccinated. Thank you very much. I think it's very clear that we may be well-intentioned, but we need to temper our good intentions with really understanding the implications for uh, various initiatives. And, and I think this panel is is really helping in that regard. Stephanie, you want to say something? Yes, I wanted to say, and, and you all can correct me if I'm wrong, 
there's no guarantee that having the vaccine means you cannot contract the virus again, or if you didn't have it before, that you can contract it. And what the, what the vaccine might do at this point in time, because you have the vaccine, the symptoms might not be as pronounced, you might not get as ill, and you could very well be walking around as a carrier. And I believe, and I might be wrong again, that the vaccine in our case in Trinidad and Tobago, having started to vaccinate people, there was a sense of complacency that, that came about. And even within the workplace, it comes back to, and, and we keep being reminded that the other precautions, the social distancing, the, the big enough workspace, the wearing of the masks, the hand sanitizing and so, those things will continue to be a need. And what we are seeing that is in some countries and some states and so, people are saying, well, everybody's vaccinated, don't wear the masks anymore. So the question is, how long will this really take to dissipate? Because we want freedoms and we believe that if we have this, we get that. It's not going to happen like that. And we have to be very, very careful that we continue to talk about the vaccine as if it's going to prevent the infection from reaching people, because that is not what it does right now in, in, in a true sense. So, so the, 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 that I, think, I think you're very correct there um, in that what the vaccine does or what they expected it to do was to reduce the symptoms. So I think a lot of the vaccines are eff the 100% efficacious for keeping you out of hospital and for keeping your symptoms mild. So far, there seems to be some indication coming out of the US. And again, remember we are in a very fluid situation. There seems to be a situation where there seems to be evidence that the vaccine would prevent transmission. We right. are early days yet, so that you have to look at it. Um, but let me go to Robbie. Robbie has his hand up. Robbie, go ahead. You're on mute, by the way. And then Lara. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I am Robbie Rambaran. And I happen to be the Deputy Chief Executive Officer of the Government National Hospital. Mm -hmm. So I am in thick and thin of this fight. Um, many of the sentiments that have discussed here, we have been going through them. Um, actually, we had a, a four hour long meeting yesterday to discuss mandatory vaccine for our healthcare worker. There are already a, a few vaccines that, they, uh, that is mandatory and we are hoping to make this one as well. Um, even our nursing director had the symptoms while other staff of our secretariat knew that she had the symptoms. They did not escalate it. The director refused to go take a test saying that she was just tired because of not having vacation from over a year because of the pandemic and she just wanted the rest. Unfortunately, on the day that we granted her the leave and she went home, she never, and she go to bed, she never woke up back. Sure. When we did the test, she was, the, 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 the test the very morning she died, it was positive. So this is a healthcare worker who had all the symptoms, refused to do a test, also refused the vaccine. Now, and these are known by her subordinates. That was very poor judgment and, and, and leadership, and it sent a bad message. Um, also, I think there will come a time that other industry will make the vaccine mandatory. There was some discussion. Um, I read a few articles that the airlines were, cons before you fly, that airlines were considering that that would be one of their requirements. I know we in Guyana here, if we have to go over to Suriname, we have to get a yellow fever vaccine. So these are things that the, the, is not we are recreating the wheel, the precedence is already set. Um, eventually, now, in terms of vaccine incentive, monetary, it might be on due pressure on, on, on employees. Um, who bears the liability and the risk thereafter? 
Um, but the good thing in Guyana, we did not depend on COVAX. We went ahead and procured millions of US dollars in vaccine. We have a population of 750,000. We have already vaccine adult population, which is 18 and over. We have um, vaccine almost 200,000. Um, almost 50,000 has been fully vaccinated. So our program is going pretty well. Um, there are still folks who don't want to take the vaccine because one, they think that if they get, because they were subsubsequently told or they, they, they learned that the vaccine does not prevent you. No vaccine prevents anybody from contracting a virus. Polio vaccine doesn't and no other one does. What it helps you to do is to fight the virus. Um, so that was a misinformation from the inception. Um, this speaks about vaccine gives blood clot. There are more blood clot in smoking, in alcohol, in contraceptives. There is more blood clot in the coronavirus in itself than the vaccines. Mm -hmm. So I believe if people actively pursue education, it can help, significantly help. Um, a good thing from, from the corporate side in Guyana is that they have been reaching out to us so that we can send a team to their, uh, to their, their forum and their organizations to do vaccine. So the, the thing about incentive, not sure it's going to help. Some people will take it. If you really want to take the vaccine, you don't need no incentive. If you really care about your life and help people's life, you don't need no incentive. Those who will take the, the incentive are those who are reluctant. They, they take the incentive because they care about their health and their well -be, uh, other well-being. No, because they might want the, the, whatever the incentive is for whatever, because they find it's uh, full a hole in their life or a gap in their life. Um, mm -hmm. And that's how I see it. But mandatory vaccine, I strongly, in my opinion, that it's heading that way at some point in time. I see mm -hmm. that there even um, an article today I, that I see if I didn't get to read it as yet, that Pfizer was saying that we might need a, a, a third dose in eight to 12 mo um, months from, from now mm -hmm. after having your, 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 your having fully vaccinated. So it's a very ticklish situation, but if I think if we do enough education, um, we will be able to overcome this. Thank you, Robbie. We'll go to Lara and then we'll go to Karen. Lara? Yes, thank you very much. And thank you for the very interesting um, presentation. So as I put in the chat, my organization has recently joined the CONVINCE uh, program, which is a global consortium collaboration of private sector companies to educate and inform our employees and by extension, their families, the wider community on, um, on vaccination. This is a partnership with the US Council for International Business, Deloitte, the World Economic Forum and so on. Um, and what I wanted to say was that a big part of being an employer and being able to convince your staff to take the vaccine is trust. And that is that the employees trust you and the information that you are giving them which is why you, you as an individual manager, employer should not be sharing anything that is not the truth, scientific fact. So to none of these crazy WhatsApps and, and all the rest of it. But more importantly is when you do have staff who take the vaccine to incorporate them into your program to become themselves advocates for other employers, because other employees, because very often, as we all know, you might be the chairman, the CEO, the manager, but you're not the real influencer. So the person who's going to be able to influence change is actually the receptionist or the secretary or whoever. So it's important to understand in your organization who those people are mm -hmm. and get them on board as part of your education, inform, inspire campaign to get people vaccinated. I mean, our challenge here, of course, is that we simply, there's almost no point promoting it because it's not available. So this is really in preparation for having it available to all employees of all ages and then, you know, bringing, taking them in my vehicle to go and get the vaccine 
you know, having vaccination drives at, at company compounds, those sorts of things, which we can't do yet because we don't have the resource to give them. So I just wanted to talk about that issue of trust and influence, because I agree. I mean, yes, I can give you a bonus and I can give you a day off here and there. But at the end of the day, if you believe the vaccine, vaccine is the right thing for you, you're going to do it for your own health and the well-being of your family. So I feel like that is a stronger angle to take. So we have time now in Trinidad, certainly, while we're getting ready for the vaccine to be available, to build that trust, engage our organizational influence. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Thank you. Kara, unmute yourself. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Karen, Karen, me and I. And I need to get in before Stephanie spoke again because Stephanie, every time she speaks, she's, she takes the points that I want to, that I wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Karen. Um, I, I would have liked to, 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 to take on Marley's, and I'm going to say Marley because I, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to bludgeon your surname at all. Um, Wow. But I would like to take that, I would have liked to take in the, those points on one by one, but I didn't get them in in order. But generally, I think that I would challenge those those points. I think there were about four four pillars um, based on looking looking at the vaccine itself. And this this goes back to where where um, Stephanie would have would have left off. Um, but well, apart from apart from not being certain that the that the that the vaccine would would prevent either infection or spread, I was going to raise two recent examples, two very public exam examples. There's a TV presenter in the states, Bill Bill Ma, who was fully vaccinated, and it came out earlier this week that they, they had to cancel his show and put him back in isolation because he got infected again. He was tested again. They test him regularly, and he tested positive again. And then a day or two after, um, it came out that the Seychelles, which was described as the most vaccinated country in the world, I think it is some, something like 70 or, or 80 percent. And they recently have an outbreak of cases again. Um, no, they they're still they're still doing some more examination of the of the of the of the spe, of the spe, 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 specifics. And they're saying that a lot of people who were infected were, in, were vaccinated, but they're, but they're all, all also among, among, among them persons who were not vaccinated at all. Um, but still, we're seeing a, 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 a situation where vaccinated persons are also being affected, being, re, uh, well, so, being um, infected by the virus still. So I'm, so I'm wondering. Is it a case of we are trying to incentivize or eventually compel? Because I could see this leading to a situation where you're not telling people um, that you have to get vaccinated or you will not get, em get employed. But are we incentivizing people to go after something that is not guaranteed to work, that will not prevent them from, from getting or spreading the, the virus um, with unproven side effects? Because even on the CDC, on the, yes, the CDC's web, website, you are seeing where they are still not still not sure um, about a number of things where the vaccine is concerned. And do we then want to be encouraging persons to, to, to take something? Um, we're not sure what the effects of it will 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 be. And would that is that is that likely to open employers to liability because we have also we have, we have also seen where the, where the manufacturers through their different um, arrange, arrange, arrangements have managed to get themselves indemnified against any any liability if something was was to go wrong. So the question then becomes who will be responsible if I am asked to take a vaccine and then something happens happens to me afterwards. So those are, those are just what I was wondering about. Thank you very much. Um, so before I bring in Marley, there's a question here, and, and it, it's related to Karen's question again from Nyola. Who bears the responsibility after an, an incentive is given by the employer and the employee still contract COVID? Um, so again, it, it, we, we're looking at what should we do? What what could we do? What are the implications? How do we assess the risk? 
how do we manage governance? Mali. Thank you, Nigel. And thank you, Karen, for your question. I think in this regard, it is important that as an employer, uh, when you incentivize your employees to take the vaccine, you incentivize them uh, to listen to their government and to listen to the World Health Organization uh, and to listen basically to all governments all around the world. Uh, because currently every country, every government, every um, CDC, similar organization um, is advising people to get the vaccine uh, unless you have some special medical condition preventing you from such. And I think pregnancy is also still a debate and children. Uh, if you don't fall in those categories, you are encouraged by basically everyone uh, to get this vaccine. I think if uh, considering that situation and considering this consensus, if you join in and as an employer, uh, it would, for me as an attorney, be very strange if you could help uh, liable for consequences of revoicing uh, the opinion of the World Health Organization, of your government and of uh, the, the public uh, health authority of your country. Uh, so considering in that light, there's of course anecdotal evidence to the other side and there will of course be complications with some people. However, the consensus is that this is better uh, than getting COVID and then spreading COVID. Uh, so in that light, I think it is safe as an employer to join in uh, with these people and, and incentivize this. Stephanie? I wanted to add that um, incentivizing is one way of encouraging the, the vaccine. But already in Europe, as in, in Rome and in Italy, and so we have where it, a decree has been passed. The government passed a decree making vaccination mandatory for all healthcare and pharmacy workers with the aim of protecting people. And already a court has ruled to uphold a decision taken by an employer who sent someone on paid leave because they refused to take the vaccine. There is already law indicating that if you don't take the vaccine, I can move you from your job and put you in another job. So there are variations to the, this mandatory vaccine coming about, and it will depend on the country. It depends on the sector in which you will you risk. But I think we need to keep in focus. This vaccine is really about protecting our lives and the lives of others. You know, we have to be careful sometimes as employers, the business comes first and we have been to some extent hearing it, you know, well, we need to keep the economy going. We need to keep the economy going. And perhaps that narrative hasn't worked in getting people to really understand why you need to take the vaccine. It's about your life, your children's life, your parents' life. And if you don't want them to die, as we said in our country here, we have an infinite uh, amount of, of, of hospital beds and medical professionals. And therefore, if we don't do what we have to do to prevent the, the, the virus, we will all fail and all, all die. I <laughs> mean, most of us will get ill. So that we really probably have to start focusing on letting the individual understand what it means for him, for her, and the family, and then the wider country. If not, you know, the incentivize, incentivizing is good an extra day, an extra um, pay or so. But what are you going to do after you get a vaccine? Are you then going to go out and hang out and perhaps contract it? You know, mm -hmm. so, so really getting to the core of this thing is about your life and my life. And let's not be, you know, the cause of the death or the illness of another person. That we have to really move to that sort of mentality. And then, I mean, so, so there, there are obligations from an employer's point of view on both sides. One, to protect the workforce uh, and, and to do whatever is necessary to protect that workforce. But going back to Lara's point, the level of trust is going to determine whether the, 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 the skeptics will be willing to listen and to understand why you are advocating for the vaccine and, and sharing the facts, taking the time to listen and working with the team 
to get everybody on board is going to be critical. I recommend um, Adam Grant's latest book. I think again, he has a chapter there called Vaccine Whisperers and Mild-Mannered Interrogators, which is worth reading. It's a different approach to getting people to change. So, um, I would like to thank you all, and I'm going to hand it over to Kamla to wrap us up. I think we had a very informative and a very engaging conversation. Look, uh, we're looking forward to, some, to doing a lot more. Gavin, thank you from Jamaica. Avia, thank you from Guyana. Stephanie, thank you from Trinidad. And Lara and Karen and, and the others, thank you for your contributions. Of course, Sophie and, and Mali for initiating this whole conversation. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, um, Nigel. Um, really, this, this has been such an important topic. And as has been pointed out uh, by Mali and the panelists and even some of um, our participants, you know, it's, it's an evolving area. And so many answers uh, just uh, evolving with us. Um, I have heard uh, persons who work in the health sector have reservations about whether they want to take the vaccines or not. And as we have uh, just bits of information as we go along, there continue to be questions in my mind. If uh, um, and until there is mandatory vaccination, which, you know, as Robbie said, you know, that they, these they are th things that are coming. But in the present moment, if an employer were to say, I would like all my staff to be vaccinated in order that we can continue to work. Uh, there were two things that, that came to mind from Mali's presentation, and, and I needed to underscore it. There's a fine line between what is coercion and what is incentive. So we need to be sure that the incentive is not so big that it actually becomes coercion. And then there's also the question of if it is that someone were to take the vaccine and then there are negative implications. You know, we have heard uh, there are several cases that were reported in the media in Trinidad and Tobago about persons who died mere days after having taken the vaccine. Uh, what are the, the, what is the implications for organizations who may have um, gone that route if family members were to say, but we knew that uh, the vaccine could have had a negative outcome because this person has underlying um, conditions and comorbidities, you know? So there continues to be a lot of questions um, as we go along. And I think that the discussion has been really important in bringing a lot of that to the forefront. I want to thank everyone for contributing to it. And um, thank you, Nigel, very much for moderating the session. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Mali, as well. Stephanie, thank you so much for accepting our invitation so quickly. Thank you, Avia and, and, um, and Gavin. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so just know that from the, the Institute, you know, we are going to be doing as much as we can to ensure that the, the conversation continues. Lara, we look forward to understanding that program that Regency is uh, partnering in, that we can help share information as well, because it's all about helping our directors and senior managers to have very informed positions, you know, as we make decisions going forward. Thank you all very much. We appreciate your time. Have a great and wonderful evening. Bye.